So those first five kind of families that we went through are the most relevant ones. But I wanted to add one, and you'll pardon me for this because it's a bit of a personal reason. As I've mentioned, I'm a terrible sleeper. Um, and at one point was taking – I didn't know at the time, and I wouldn't have cared, um, what is what is in fact uh, like the mirtazapine is. It's an atypical antidepressant, but it's called trazodone. Trazodone, I, I just thought it was a sleep medication. And I can even – so let me – briefly, very briefly, why I stopped taking it, and I am not giving any medical advice, is that it can have this off-target effect of increasing prolactin. And I'd had a medical, I'd had a blood test. This was about a year ago and found that my prolactin levels were like 10 times higher than they should be in a man. Um, and, and so that was, uh, that was of course, naturally very concerning. And since I've come off it, it's taken time. I've had probably three blood tests over the past year um, through a company called Blokes, where they really do a very thorough dive um, into blood markers of health. And thankfully, when I, when I first saw my prolactin levels, I actually worried that it might be a prolactinoma or a prolactin secreting tumor because they were so high, but I didn't have any other symptoms of a like a pituitary tumor or a brain tumor. And then I realized that this drug had this effect on prolactin. And thankfully, as I was mentioning or getting around to, my levels have been steadily coming down. Now, having said all that, so I included trazodone a bit out of a personal interest so trazodone is an, an atypical antidepressant that acts both as a serotonin reuptake inhibitor, so having a little bit of an SSRI, but also as a serotonin 2A receptor antagonist. So this makes it helpful for depressive symptoms and anxiety with a consequence of having a sedative effect, so being very commonly used as a sleep aid. Now, it's the actual evidence that shows trazodone having a metabolic effect is very modest. There is like a, a little evidence that suggests there could be some minor weight gain. Um, but overall, of all the ones I've just mentioned, it is absolutely the most inert. Um, now, please, again, I'm not stating this to advocate its use. I just explained my own personal concerns with it. But the reason it didn't make that original list that I put together is because there's not a lot of evidence to suggest that it has a any noticeable or substantial or meaningful metabolic effect, especially when used at general the doses that it's used for for insomnia. Now, I don't I can't speak to the dosing that might be used for actual mental health use. For all I know, perhaps it does start to become more relevant. But even then, there's very limited evidence. Um, that that there's a, there's some evidence to suggest minor weight gain, but generally it has a relatively favorable metabolic profile, particularly compared with any of the others. Now that I've talked about the main um, antidepressant and anti-anxiety families of medications, I wanted to revisit something that I'd been touching on earlier, particularly with regards to the changes in appetite and cravings. Because some of these medications like SSRIs, TCAs, and the antipsychotics do interfere as I've noted, with the regulation of hunger and satiety in the brain by regulating those hormones, the neurotransmitters that I mentioned earlier, serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine, all of which do have some influence into appetite. But it's not just a general, I'm hungry for everything that I can shove in my mouth. Um, firstly, antidepressants and carbohydrate craving. Antidepressants, particularly TCAs, have been linked to carbohydrate craving and weight gain. So a particular craving for carbohydrate-rich foods. SSRIs have also been shown to do this with some patients reporting increased carb craving. And then lastly, the psychotropic drugs. Many psychotropic medications, including antidepressants and mood stabilizers, like ones I didn't talk about, including lithium, are known to increase appetite and, once again, carbohydrate cravings. So as the patient begins to, or the, the person using the medication begins to notice they they're craving a certain type of food it the the theme of all of these cravings is carbohydrates one of the common foundational causes or, or contributors that's a safer word that anxiety and depression have that they share is a phenomenon known as brain glucose hypometabolism i've talked about this before it's actually a foundational phenomenon for myriad neurological disorders including things that 
that you think none of which are related, like Alzheimer's disease, migraine headaches, epilepsy, depression, bipolar disorders, anxiety. These are all very, very different diseases. And yet they consistently share one thing in common, namely that the brain isn't able to obtain sufficient energy from glucose. Or if you measure the degree to which the brain in a person, say with depression or migraines or et cetera, is using glucose, it is less than the brain of someone who doesn't manifest with those neurological disorders. So that does suggest that in addition to whatever other kind of noxious stimuli or, or diverse causes that may be contributing to each of these two distinct disorders, one common contributor is the fact that the brain is going hungry and it's manifesting differently in different people. Now, that's particularly tragic in light of the fact that a general cause of this brain glucose hypo metabolism is an insulin resistance of the brain. Because you see, the brain has some glucose transporters that are dependent on insulin. So it needs insulin to be working well to open those glucose transporter doors, if you will, thereby allowing the glucose to come in and nourish the brain. Now, the brain has two primary fuels. Glucose is one of them, and ketones are the other. Now, there's actually, the brain can also use lactate, but that, I've mentioned that in the previous metabolic classroom, so I won't revisit it again, and it's generally more of a modest contributor. <clears throat> so glucose and ketones. Ketones are a tremendous fuel for the brain, a very viable fuel for the brain, and even perhaps the preferred fuel. I'm just going to put out some numbers here. Let's say a fasting glucose is at 5 millimolar, and then a fasting ketone is a two millimolar. That's, of course, less than half of what the glucose is. Yet even in that metabolic state, the brain is getting most of its energy. Well over half of it, all of its energetic needs are coming from ketones. That clearly suggests a preference, and it's not for glucose. Now, why do I mention that? Because there are some papers published, and I have one linked here, showing that if you increase the ketones in a patient with mental health, like depression or bipolar disorders you improve the outcomes that ketogenic diets have been shown to improve mitochondrial function. They've been shown to improve neurotransmitter balance um, and, you know, improving insulin sensitivity, helping the brain be more properly or adequately nourished. 